On the streets of the tri-state, weapons rule. From handguns to high-powered assault rifles. The officers of the Cincinnati Police Department come across a multitude of types of guns. Police say they're facing ever-increasing firepower. The assault weapon type guns to the small caliber single-shot handguns. But when criminals are caught, their weapons that's an AK-47. Are confiscated. It's a semi-auto. But what happens to those weapons after they're seized? Well, the answer to that depends on which side of the river you're on. That's right. Here in Ohio, most of the guns confiscated from criminals are destroyed. But over here in Kentucky, every gun that's seized must by law be sold. That includes guns used in violent crimes, even murder weapons. Welcome to the confiscated weapons sale at the Kentucky State Police Supply Branch, where the bidding is fast and furious. Only gun dealers can bid on these confiscated weapons and ammunition. Some dealers have traveled a long way. Where are you from? Virginia. Tennessee. Okay. Many others live closer to home. Ripley, Ohio. Nicholasville. When it was over. How was it today? It was fun. The dealers hauled out hundreds of guns. Did you get anything good? Nothing. A few things. Including assault rifles. What is this thing? It's SKS. Some had to make more than one trip to get all the guns they bought here. Still a demand for them. Yes, a big demand. To meet that demand, Kentucky passed this law 20 years ago, which mandates all confiscated firearms shall be sold at public auction to federally licensed firearms dealers, with all money going to the state and local police. Last year, confiscated gun auctions in Kentucky brought in more than $628,000. 20% went to the state police. 80% was distributed, as required by law, as grants from Homeland Security to five police departments to buy bulletproof vests, guns, and ammunition for officers. We're still waiting on a full list of what was purchased and which departments benefited. Are you surprised? I am a little bit surprised. I am a little bit surprised. Cincinnati Police Lieutenant Colonel Terry Thiege is surprised by Kentucky's law because Ohio law requires a court to approve selling confiscated firearms. Here in Cincinnati, a city ordinance simply says all weapons need to be destroyed for public safety reasons. So you have a municipal code, you have a law, you have a city law that says you must destroy. Correct. Last year, CPD destroyed 1,257 firearms. In 2016, CPD destroyed 1,142 guns. All of them melted down at a metal company that's not in Ohio. Would it be Kentucky? It might be. It might be across the river. And that is ironic. <laughs> that is ironic. While police don't make policy, CPD is pleased to get rid of the guns. Just to alleviate that question of whose hands it could possibly get into, um, the better alternative is to destroy it. Back across the river in Newport, Police Chief Tom Collins abides by, but does not support Kentucky's mandate to sell seized guns. I'm not happy about it, and, and I think any law enforcement uh, officer feels the same way. Once we get a weapon off the street, um, I don't really want to have to deal with that weapon again. Chief Collins is so unhappy, he won't accept money collected from that gun auction in Frankfurt. So you made a conscientious decision not to get a grant from the sale of the weapons. That's correct. You must believe in that very strongly. I do. But gun dealers have strong beliefs too, even if they didn't want to talk about that on camera. But I don't really want to do interviews because I, really, I, under, I, I don't really like the media, no offense. And with a strong law and millions of dollars in sales, the sound of the auctioneer here will not likely be silenced anytime soon. So
Even before I aired the first installment of Dwayne, Is That Right?, several of you wrote to me stating or implying that money from the Ohio Lottery is not going where it's supposed to go, to fund our schools. So that's the question this week. In the latest... Dwayne, Is That Right? Powerball. Oh. Billions of dollars have changed hands since the Ohio Lottery began in the mid-70s. And every dollar of the net profits, that's the amount that's left over after prize payouts and costs, goes to something called the Lottery Profits Education Fund, which is earmarked only for education. Since the beginning, the Ohio Lottery has pumped in $24.3 billion to fund K-12 education. Last fiscal year, which ended in June, nearly $1.1 billion was deposited to the Lottery Profits Education Fund. But that's just a fraction of what it costs to educate our children. In 2018, the cost was $10.5 billion. So that big lottery payment is less than a tenth of the overall funding. It may not be clear to see, but the claim that Ohio lottery money is no longer funding education is wrong. I'm Dwayne Pullman. This is what democracy looks like! Hey, hey! In Indianapolis... Christ God Jesus got to go! Diabetics, including a busload from the tri-state, converge on pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly. Medicines for people, not for profit! Protesting sharp increases in insulin prices, including Lilly's popular Humalog, a fast-acting insulin taken before meals. When do we want it? Now! Spikes in the price of Humalog and other insulin products made by Lilly and two other pharmaceutical companies, diabetics say, are forcing them to face deadly choices. Hey, hey! Ho, ho! Price Scout Gene has got to go! Hey. According to the American Diabetes Association, the average list price of all insulin has skyrocketed in recent years, nearly tripling between 2002 and 2013, adding the reasons for this increase are not entirely clear. We asked for an on-camera interview with the company, but in a written statement, the Senior Director of Corporate Communications kindly declined, stating Lilly's last price increase for insulin was May of 2017, which she says has been Lilly's one price increase over the last 26 months. That May 2017 increase for Humalog was 7.8%, but that was on top of a 7.51% increase in 2016 and a hike of 16.98% in 2015 and 20.81% in 2014. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, the price of Humalog has increased by 1,157% in 20 years from 1996 to 2017. Lilly has offered as much as 40% discounts to patients who were having trouble paying, but has yet to answer our direct questions about why its insulin prices increase so much. What killed your son? Official cause of death was diabetic ketoacidosis. Unofficially, he died from corporate greed. Nicole Smith-Holt came from Minnesota to protest. Her son, Alec, died in 2017, just months after he turned 26. He was no longer eligible for my health insurance. Even though he was working, Alec could not afford the continuing cost of paying for life-saving insulin, including Humalog. Well, he didn't have enough money in the bank to cover the $1,000 plus additional $300 for his supplies. He started rationing his insulin. He was found dead three days before his payday. All right. Yeah. A mother still grieves over losing her daughter, Antavia Lee Warsham. I miss her. Antavia was just 22 years old. She had two jobs, including working at the concession at Bengals games. It was not enough to pay the bills, and a high deductible meant Antavia had to pay thousands out of pocket for her insulin, including Humalog, before her insurance would begin to pay. Roughly between twelve to thirteen hundred dollars um, for again a ninety day supply. Twelve to thirteen hundred dollars. Um, twelve, twelve, twelve to thirteen hundred dollars. She couldn't afford her insulin. She rationed. When my son found her in her bed, she had a pen in her bed, but it, it was empty. 
In its statement, Eli Lilly addressed that issue, saying, Unfortunately, some people are provided high-deductible insurance plans, which require people to pay thousands of dollars before coverage begins. The official cause on Antavia's death certificate, the same as the cause of Alex's death, diabetic ketoacidosis, a buildup of acid in the blood that can be, and often is, fatal when a diabetic doesn't get enough insulin. She died as much from poverty yes. as anything else. Yes. And Tavia's mom is now on a mission to change that for other diabetics, including her other daughter. Because I'm also a type 1 diabetic. And the cost of living on insulin is just as steep as it was for her sister. Without it, what does it mean for you? I go without it, then I'm not here. Alec's mom is on a mission, too, from testifying in Washington. And Alec is not the only one who has paid the ultimate price. Chris Gardine has got to go! To protesting in Indianapolis. She has one clear message for anyone who will listen. Stop the greed. Start putting patients' lives over your profits. Chris Gardine has got to go! Okay, so... In response to increase...